What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back today to discuss a little David Cronenberg. Last week, I saw his new movie, The Shrouds, at a press screening at the New York Film Festival. And I was kind of struggling to get going with the video because when, the, when a movie's not coming out for like six more months, it's like, well, what do you discuss? And what I finally landed on was, why don't we rank that movie relative to the rest of his career? And as soon as I landed on that idea, I went a little insane. So for the last few days, I've been burying myself in his interviews, his short films, episodes of TV, and of course, his movies. His movies in my top 10, I've seen so many times, I can basically screen them like behind my eyelids in my sleep. But I wanted to revisit a lot of his lesser known movies and a lot of his less popular movies. So after a couple days of doing nothing other than watching David Cronenberg movies, thinking about David Cronenberg, writing about David Cronenberg, obsessing over uh, David Cronenberg, I think I'm finally ready to come up for air and share my official, I guess he's made 23 feature films total if he includes Stereo and the original Crimes of the Future. And he definitely includes those as feature films. So I think I'm finally ready to do my definitive list, ranking all 23 feature films by the legend legendary David Cronenberg. And I really have no idea how long this video is going to take. Maybe it'll be 30 minutes. Maybe it'll be two hours. I've got a fresh cup of coffee to keep me fueled. But if David Cronenberg at 81 years old can still crank out interesting movies, well then the least I can do is spare a few hours of my time to, uh, to celebrate his amazing career. Because he's one of the last filmmakers that I discovered as a movie obsessed child who's still active today and making interesting movies. I mean, in that list would be filmmakers like Paul Verhoeven, but there are not a lot of filmmakers where, like before I even knew who they were by name where I was watching their movies, where they're still going when I'm 48 years old, as much as I'm loath to admit it. But long before I knew who David Cronenberg was by name, I was watching movies like The Fly, or I was enjoying his cameos in horror movies like Nightbreed. He was absolutely fantastic in that. But when I got to college, I just went all in, and he was flying high at that time with the release of Crash. Very controversial movie at that time. And because of that time period, I'm much more familiar with and much more obsessed with the first half of his career as opposed to the second half of his career. And I know that's kind of a cliche, predictable thing to say, but like I've seen The Brood and Scanners and Videodrome and Death Ringers and all those movies many, many, many times. Whereas in the second half of his career, you know, a lot of those movies prior to getting prepared for this uh, video, I'd only seen them once. So I went back and rewatched all the movies that I'd only seen one time because I just wanted to like, you know, give the second half of his career its due, even if like from a personal taste, I much prefer the, uh, the, the earlier work. And also, by some strange coincidence, I woke up today with a swollen eyelid due to a, uh, a sty that I got years ago. But like once a year, it flares up. It makes me feel and look a little physically deformed. But the way I figure it, if Viggo Mortensen can strip down and fight two guys buck-ass naked in Eastern Promises, the least I can do is just embrace my physical deformity while uh, making this video. And who knows? Maybe it'll uh, it'll explode in some strange, like blood-crazed, like sex-crazed parasite will crawl out of my face halfway through the video and go out go out into the streets of Manhattan and create some uh, some blood crazed epidemic because as everyone knows David Cronenberg is the undisputed master of body horror, a world where threats are much more likely to come from within our own bodies as opposed to an external threat in most traditional horror movies. If this picture doesn't make you scream and squirm, you'd better see a psychiatrist. Quick. And what's fascinating now in 2024 is seeing how so many filmmakers have kind of taken the baton and run with it. And they're taking inspiration from his ideas and his style. Movies like Titan and The Substance clearly owe, clearly owe a debt of gratitude to the movies of David Cronenberg. But let's not limit Cronenberg to one category of filmmaking because he's tackled crime sagas, drag racing, psychoanalysis, social satire. The merging of and the relationship between sex and technology, or gynecology, drug abuse, or just good old-fashioned literary adaptations. I think he doesn't get enough credit as someone who's very interested in adapting great works of literature from the past, but he almost became a novelist. He's written one novel, but like early on in his career... He was at a crossroads. Like, did he want to pursue science? He started out studying science. I uh, can't remember which uh, specific field as an undergrad. But then he got really into books. He grew up to the sound of typewriters. His father was a, uh, a writer. So in spite of having the label of body horror slapped on him a long time ago, he remains one of our most literary filmmakers, whether he's writing original screenplays or adapting plays or adapting books. But for those of you out there who've been kind enough to follow this channel for a few years, you'll remember that I did a top 10 list of his work about four years ago. And I very deliberately didn't watch it prior to making this video because, if, if possible, I want to avoid repeating myself, which is perhaps inevitable. But who knows? Maybe I'll end up getting caught in a few lies or contradicting myself because 
my top 10 favorite movies by him have more or less remained the same. Like the order might change a little bit depending upon my mood or what I've watched recently, but there are 23 movies to be considered and ranking 11 to 23 I found to be much more challenging than ranking 1 through 10. But I welcome any and all pushback to my official ranking because for a filmmaker whose filmography has such a deep bench of great movies and it has so much consistency in terms of uh, the level of quality that it brings to the table, I recognize that a lot of the movies that I regard as my least favorite or like the ones that I'm least fond of might be some of the favorites for some other fans. So once again, I welcome any and all pushback to any of my assertions that I make in this video. But before we get to the official ranking, let me give a shout out to some of the short films and his TV work. I include Stereo and the original Crimes of the Future as feature films because David Cronenberg does. They're over an hour long, which, you know, what is a feature film? Well, some will say it's like, you know, 45 minutes or longer. Who knows? But he calls them features, so I'm going to call them features for the purposes of this list. But if you want to go back and see his early days, you can hunt down Transfer from 1966 and From the Drain from 1967 on YouTube. And once again, back then he was considering, does he want to be a scientist or a novelist or whatever? And I won't claim that you can see the early signs of genius in those early short films. But if you're a completionist and you want to know his entire career, you definitely need to hunt down those films. And throughout his career, periodically, he's returned to making short films like his short film Camera from 2000. It was included in this compilation film Short Six from 2001. But if you love the character of Barry Convex from, uh, from Videodrome, you'll definitely recognize Leslie Carlson, who's worked with Cronenberg many times. Uh, he also has another interesting short called At the Suicide of the Last Jew in the World at the Last Cinema in the World. And that movie was, uh, he made it in 2007 and it was included in the compilation To Each His Own Cinema from 2007. But it's interesting how he's always talking about the ever-changing technology from like his earliest days watching movies in the late 40s when like he would wake up and go watch Saturday morning cartoons and pirate movies and westerns in the late 40s. But like... He's, he's one of the best filmmakers when it comes to identifying new technology, embracing new technology, and you can see that at play in movies like Videodrome and so on and so forth. But like, he's always talking about how cinema's like, permanently in the process of being like perpetually disrupted and no era of filmmaking in terms of the exhibition and the consumption of movies has ever returned. It's always evolving and changing, but like in the context of this short, you see how he's the last Jew in the last cinema, and in the cinema, like all the chairs have been ripped up, and it's all filled with garbage and that sort of thing, and he's about to kill himself. But you can see how his opinion of cinema in 2007 was not necessarily a, a positive one. So it makes me wonder, like, what would that short con what would that short contain if he were to make that short today in 2024? But my favorite short by him is The Nest from 2013. And I can't really share a clip from it here because it's just one shot and it's of a topless woman with her doctor talking about how she wants to have one of her breasts removed because she thinks that a bunch of wasps or insects are breeding inside of it. And Cronenberg, in typical Cronenberg fashion, is like, well, I'm happy to remove your breasts, but what am I, what am I supposed to do with the bugs? Like, I'm, I'm not an entomologist. And I was like, yeah, I mean, just... His love of science and that kind of clinical, medical approach to to horror has never gone away. And so even in 2013, when he wasn't really making body horror movies anymore, he would still indulge with the occasional short. And he also, was, uh, his last one, or his most recent one, was The Death of David Cronenberg from 2021, which he co-directed with C Caitlin Cronenberg. But it's only one minute long, but if you want, want to see some eerie shots of a filmmaker wrestling with his own mortality, that short is also worth hunting down. Now, as far as David Cronenberg's TV work is concerned, a lot of it is really hard to find. From 1971 to 1975, he made a lot of TV movies, so let me know if you've heard of any of these. Jim Ritchie, Sculptor, Letter from Michelangelo, Tourette's, which was an episode of uh, Program X, Don Valley, Fort York, Fort York, In the Dirt, Lakeshore, Scarborough Bluffs, and Winter Garden. A lot. Of, I, I reached out to my friend Martin Kessler, who used to li live in Toronto, but he's my resident expert in all things Canadian when it comes to their cinema. And he basically said, like, there's some museum. If you go there, you can probably find those old episodes. But he had a long career in TV before he made uh, Shivers, his, you know, his first like official debut commercial feature film. But he also worked in uh, the late 70s on two episodes of Peep Show. He worked on a show called Scales of Justice in the early 90s where he did two episodes. Most famously, when it comes to his TV work, he did an episode of Friday the 13th, the series. And in 1988, on February 13th, he released an episode called Faith Healer. And if you're a fan of good old-fashioned anthology films and or horror shows like Tales from the Crypt, and things like that, definitely check it out. You've got the uh, the actor Robert Silverman, who people will recognize as the uh, guy suffering from tumors from uh, psychoplasmics in The Brood. But you have this interesting premise where Faith Healer, he's a charlatan, but he discovers this glove where he actually can heal people. However, 
he has to take whatever their injury or illness is and then transfer it to somebody immediately afterwards. So he's a healer, but he's also a killer and a murderer. And so anyway, if you like horror stories and deal, dealing with gnarly tumors and all sorts of gross, disgusting stuff, Faith Healers are readily available on YouTube. If you've already watched The Fly and Scanners and The Brood and Shivers and Rabbit and all these movies over and over and over again, you definitely owe it to yourself to see Faith Healer. Also, before I go any further, I should acknowledge that there are a lot of key collaborators in David Cronenberg's career where certain filmmakers and technicians that he's worked with over and over and over again, and probably the most prominent would be Howard Shore, who wrote no fewer than 16 fucking scores for David Cronenberg. His movies would be very different without Howard Shore. Or editor Ronald Sanders, who did 17 movies. Viggo Mortensen, who acted in four. Uh, director of photography, Mark Irwin, who shot six. Costume designer, Denise Cronenberg, who worked on 12 of his films. Art director, Carol Spear, who also worked on 12. Actor, Robert Silverman, who acted in five. And of course, cinematographer, Peter Shushitsky, who shot 11 of his movies. Like, as much as I might love and like to kind of like worship at the altar of David Cronenberg, a filmmaker... A filmmaker basically is like it's stuck in the mud unless they have a lot of other you know fellow mad geniuses to help bring his vision or his stories or his images to the screen. So I'm sure I've left out a few key collaborators from Cronenberg's career, but those are some of the people who have made his career as distinctive as it is. And one last shout out, over the last couple of days, I watched a ton of interviews with David Cronenberg on YouTube. And luckily, there's a wealth of great videos. Uh, one of my favorites is just Cronenberg on Cronenberg, where he goes over his entire career right up to the point of Cosmopolis. I think he recorded it like 10 or 11 years ago. That gives you a great, like, comprehensive overview of his entire career. But the the mother load, like the the heavyweight champion of interviews interviews with David Cronenberg, has got to be Take One Fear on Film from 1982, where Mick Garris sits down with John Carpenter, John Landis, and David Cronenberg, and just talks about like the horror genre and what they're doing. And, like, it's heartbreakingly short. It's only like 25 minutes long. It's like, dude, how come it couldn't be 25 hours long? Because at that time, John Landis was working on American Werewolf in London, John Carpenter was working on The Thing, and David Cronenberg was working on Videodrome. So you're seeing three horror masters um, at the peak of their power, at the peak of their craft, at the peak of their popularity, uh, working on arguably the best movies that any of them would ever make. And it's just fascinating hearing David Cronenberg talking about like dealing with government censorship because in America, we don't have it. We have a, like, a self-regulatory body. But in Canada, as he says, compared with what happens in, in Ontario, which is that they take your picture, they take every print, and they cut it, and they hand it back to you, and they say, this is your new movie. They keep the, the pieces that they've taken out, and you go to jail for two years if those are projected, if you put the pieces back. And that's real censorship. And he also talks a little bit about the process of previewing movies and how he actually is totally open to allowing the audience to kind of push him around a little bit because by the time he gets to the preview process, he's lived with the movie for so long, he almost kind of can't see it in objective terms anymore. So it's very useful to like figure out like, where is it working, where is it not working? And he will make changes. Like the famous head exploding scene from Scanners was moved a few minutes deeper into the movie, whereas initially it was much earlier in the movie. So once again, Take One, Fear on Film, that's also readily available on YouTube. I think I've listened to it now like 10 times through. It is pure solid gold. But at long last, it is time to stop bullshitting and let's rank Cronenberg's movies from number 23 down to number one. And we're going to start with Crimes of the Future from 1970. Not to be confused with Crimes of the Future from 2022, but this movie... His first two feature films, both Stereo and Crimes of the Future, they are very lean, they're very avant-garde, they have almost no dialogue or even like music or sound effects. They are experimental avant-garde films inspired by a lot of the experimental European avant-garde films that he was watching in the 50s and 60s. Uh, David Cronenberg's never struck me as a giant film freak. While he will speak very fondly about you know, discovering La Strada at an Italian theater in Toronto as a young man, like he doesn't strike me as someone like Scorsese where he was watching hundreds if not thousands of classic movies because he's got so many other influences in his life. And I feel like that's very healthy. Filmmakers should have some influences in their lives that are not movies. Like, find, find another discipline that will inform your work. But uh, film critic and writer Kim Newman had this great comment about, uh, about Cronenberg's first two movies. In his 1988 book, Nightmare Movies, he wrote that uh, Crimes of the Future is being more fun to read about in synopsis than to watch, improving along with stereo, that it's possible to be boring and interesting at the same time. And I feel like that's the best way to describe both Crimes of the Future as well as stereo. They are interesting, 
and they are boring. And I always feel like it's a bit of a cop-out describing a movie as interesting. I used to go to a lot of screenings with uh, students at the American Film Institute in L.A., and, and, and any time they were watching one of their friends' movies and didn't want to criticize them, say, oh, I thought it was really interesting. Like, no, what you're trying to say is that it's boring and that it sucks, but you're also trying to be a friend and be encouraging. So, yeah, anytime somebody describes a movie as interesting, try to read between the lines about what they actually might mean. But when you watch a movie like Crimes of the Future, it definitely makes you appreciate the astonishing scores contributed by Howard Shore to all of David Cronenberg's later movies. But here is a, um, at least the intro to the plot ripped straight from the pages of Wikipedia. Set in 1997, the film follows Adrian Tripod, an occasional director of the House of Skin, a dermatological clinic. He embarks on a quest to find his mentor, the insane dermatologist Antoine Rouge. Rouge has vanished after a devastating plague caused by cosmetic products, wiped out all sexually mature women, allegedly the virus mutated now affecting men and claiming Rouge's life like right there we're off to the races when you watch the movie you're like how come the movie's not remotely as interesting as the uh, the plot written out but uh, as Kim Newman said on the page the movie is fascinating in practice less so but like I said before these first two features well, they're, they're important stages in David Cronenberg's development because he didn't know yet that he wanted to be a commercial filmmaker. He was still kind of like exploring and trying to figure out what his options were. And so I almost feel like he needed to get these avant-garde experimental movies out of his system before he could focus on commercial filmmaking like, uh, like Shivers. But while we're on the subject of David Cronenberg's early avant-garde films, for my number 22, we're going to go with Stereo from 1969. The, uh, the full title is Stereo Tile 3B of a C-A-E-E -E Educational Mosaic. I mean, can you imagine how weird David Cronenberg must have been when he was like an undergrad or a, a grad student when he was first coming out of the gate? I just imagine that like he'd be that guy at the party who would like be off in the corner having these strange conversations that would just give people nightmares and or amazing inspiration for uh, for many days to come. But what's interesting about stereo is how it's it's warm up for scanners because you have uh, experiments related to telepathy as well as experiments related to all sorts of uh, sexual experimentation, which obviously he would explore in depth with uh, many of his films. But you have one patient who quite literally like wounds himself in the forehead with a drill trying to relieve some of the pressure, which would obviously be reused with uh, Michael Ironside's character in Scanners 12 years later. Why did you do it, Daryl? Why did you drill the hole? Mm, too much pressure. Typical Cronenbergian flourish, the, the entire story unfolds at this place called the Canadian Academy of Erotic Inquiry. I mean, it's like some storytellers, I wouldn't say he, they like emerge like fully formed from the womb, from the womb, but they definitely have certain preoccupations or hang-ups or certain uh, topics that they keep coming back to. And I just love how like through sexual exploration, He's trying to find ways to unlock telepathic potential in some of these characters, and there are all sorts of weird scenes. Like, I think the most interesting one is you have a, a, a naked girl sitting there blindfolded while another guy is like massaging and fondling this plastic model that you would see like in a biology lab where like all the organs are removed, and he's basically trying to stimulate her sexually while massaging certain parts of the mannequin. It's totally deranged, but... The black and white photography is absolutely gorgeous. Just from an early age, David Cronenberg, who also was his own DP on this, he just had a great eye. And he's one of those filmmakers who has great confidence in his imagery. Like, he doesn't need to shake the camera a lot. He doesn't need to even move the camera a lot. He always feels like if you have great actors and great material and great lighting, well, then, like, trust the image and, like, let that camera just uh, soak it all in. And, yeah, I, I love his photographic style. It just shows how um, he has great confidence in his material. But I should also give a shout out to actor Ronald Mladzik, who stars in this movie. He also starred in Crimes of the Future from 1970, Shivers, as well as Rabbit. He's, he's yet another one of those collaborators that Cronenberg worked with over and over and over again. But I think I've dwelled enough on Crimes of the Future in stereo. Let's move on to my number 21, M. Butterfly from 1993. And this is one of those movies where, like, Cronenberg has a couple of movies where I watch them several times and I keep waiting for the big aha moment where I'll fall in love with them. But M. Butterfly... I just remain kind of numb to its allure. And what's funny is how like the play apparently in the late 80s was just like this massive success. People just went fucking crazy for it. And yet the movie was a uh, kind of a bomb. And uh, Cronenberg likes to joke about how this was the first time that he really like sold out. It was the biggest budget he'd worked with yet. It had a budget of about $18 million, And he said, ironically, if there was ever a film of mine that you could call a sellout, it was M. Butterfly. But the film had a screenplay adapted by the author of the play, and that author's name is David Henry Huang. And the story, it's entwined with the opera of Madame Butterfly, but the story unfolds from the point of view of a French diplomat played by Jeremy Irons, 
who is serving a uh, sentence in prison for treason. And through a series of flashbacks, you learn about this love affair he had with a uh, Chinese opera singer who not only was a spy for the Chinese government, but also a man, which was part of traditional Beijing opera at that time. And Cronenberg has attributed the failure of the movie to uh, the film by Neil Jordan, The Crying Game, kind of stealing its thunder and kind of getting overshadowed. Who knows? There are plenty of people out there who say this movie was ahead of its time. There are plenty of people out there who say this movie is thunderously dull. I'll let you decide because it's time to move on to my number 20, Fast Company from 1979. Don't go away, fans, because there's lots more coming right at you. It's criminal to keep a lover like you on the road for so long. You want to win. You can't stand still. And on first glance, Fast Company appears to be such a strange kind of cultural oddity in that it, it takes place in between all of Cronenberg's you know, most famous early body horror films. But he's also interested in cars. Like, once again, David Cronenberg has many interests. As we see in Crash later on, he's very preoccupied with uh, automobiles. But this is a movie about drag racers and the women they're in love with. And I won't claim to be a giant car buff, but I do enjoy those late 70s car movies and truck movies, whether you're talking about like Smokey and the Bandit or Convoy. But this was not a, a personal film for David Cronenberg. This was more or less work for hire. Like, I think he did some revisions on the screenplay, but he admits he directed the movie in order to get a paycheck. He wanted to support his family. But on that movie, he met Carol Spear and Mark Irwin and Ronald Sanders, some of his chief collaborators, oh, and also Brian Day, who he would work with for many more years to come. So Fast Company is an important movie in his overall filmography, but this movie is worth watching for two reasons. First and foremost, it stars William Smith, one of those ruggedly masculine guys that just really doesn't exist anymore in the movies. But in the 1970s, you had these guys that were just covered in veins and sinew and they drove cars and they you know, drank booze and fucked hot chicks and that sort of thing. He's just a total stud. Such a stud that John Milius cast him as Conan's father in Conan the Barbarian in 1982. He's the only guy who was masculine enough to be compelling or convincing as the father of Arnold Schwarzenegger. But of course, his girlfriend in this movie is played by the lovely Claudia Jennings, who has the distinction of being my all-time favorite playmate from Playboy magazine in the pre-internet era where people would still look at actual like paper and print and magazines to get their rocks off. She was one of the lovely, loveliest ladies who ever graced their pages, and as a result, she had this great career in the 1970s doing a lot of exploitation films, movies about like roller derby and you know truckers and all, bank robbers and all kinds of crazy shit. She was all over the place in the 1970s and sadly died uh, really, really young from a, this horrible car accident. So one of the last movies that she ever did was Fast Company, and um, yeah, she's absolutely delightful. So if you're a Claudia Jennings admirer like myself, definitely, definitely watch Fast Company. But let's move on to my number 19, Cosmopolis from 2012, based on a book by Don DeLillo starring Robert Pattinson. And Robert Pattinson's worked with Cronenberg on two occasions. And this is one of those interesting movies which kind of disproves the rule that like everyone always thinks that filmmakers kind of sit in their uh, sit in their laboratory kind of planning out their entire career in terms of like, well, now's my body horror phase and now's my art house phase and blah, blah, blah. Filmmakers aren't really that, like, I guess, deliberate in deciding like what phase of their career they're about to embark upon because sometimes movies will get offered to them that, that, that never even occurred to him. And while he was familiar with the books of Don DeLillo, he had never read Cosmopolis. As he said in an interview about the film, he wouldn't shy away from a horror project just because he felt like he'd moved on to a different phase of his career, nor will he shy away from a book that he was totally unfamiliar with. But I would argue this movie is, it's a mixed bag. There's some really cool stuff in it. I mean, pretty much with all this movie is moving forward. There's some really cool stuff in it. Robert Pattinson is fucking fantastic in this. He basically plays this billionaire finance wizard who's losing his entire fortune in one day as he drives around in this limo conducting meetings around New York. And he's taking meetings while getting prostate exams from his doctors. And he's meeting with hookers and having all these crazy experiences. But he basically lives in this like self-contained reality of his own making while there are all sorts of protests going on all around him and all sorts of uh, political instability. And it's interesting, and at times it's very funny, like when Robert Pattinson shoots himself in the hand just to kind of know what it feels like, Robert Pattinson really um, really sells the moment. And there are also some really good scenes with this fiance played by Sarah Gadon or Gadon. I'm not quite sure how she pronounces her last name, but she's been in several Cronenberg movies, including Dangerous Method, as well as uh, Map to the Stars. But she's, uh, she's a billionaire as well, and she has this preternatural ability to just like, to smell it when he's been up to no good because she's been abstaining from having sex with him. So naturally, Robert Pattinson is like fucking everything that moves in the city of New York. But she has these great scenes where she's, like, she can just quite literally smell the sin coming off of his body. I don't like saying this. But? 
You smell of sex. That's my doctor's appointment, you smell. I smell sex all over you. It's an interesting movie, once again, to use that term. I just don't think it's completely satisfying, but well worth a look if you are a Robert Pattinson fan or if you're a David Cronenberg completionist or if, you, uh, if you're a fan of the books of Don DeLillo. I read White Noise back in college, but I won't claim to be some massive admirer of his work. But for me, this is one of many Cronenberg movies which exemplifies a problem where sometimes those movies just kind of run out of gas. And even some of the movies that I really like will run out of gas. Like I love uh, Dead Ringers and Videodrome. Those are two of my favorites. I think both of those movies just kind of dissolve as opposed to giving us a um, a big climax. Uh, Crash has that problem. Definitely his new movie, The Shrouds, has that problem. And maybe that's just like a, a personal thing. But he knows how to give some movies a big dramatic finish. Because if you watch a movie like The Fly or Scanners or The Dead Zone, those have really satisfying conclusions. Or The Brood, that is a really satisfying conclusion. But there are a lot of movies in David Cronenberg's career where... You won't be alone if you think that the movie just kind of dissolves into the ether as opposed to wrapping up with a big triumphant climax. But from a number 18, we have another movie from that same period, A Dangerous Method from 2011. The screenplay was adapted by writer Christopher Hampton from his 2002 stage play, The Talking Cure, which was based on the 1993 nonfiction book by John Kerr, A Most Dangerous Method, the story of Jung, Freud, and Sabina Spielrein. I'm sure I'm fucking up her last name, but this is a movie about psychoanalysis analysis and uh, analytical psychology, you know, the early days, basically like 1902 up through World War One, where yes, like the Western Europe was enjoying this nice explosion of, uh, of new ideas that would basically transform the world as we know it. And I like this movie. It's got a good cast. I mean, I like Fassbender. I like Mortensen. I like Kira Knightley. And there's some real kinky sex stuff. Like Kira Knightley's character, she initially suffers from hysteria which makes her, uh, she's struggling to kind of get through her life. And one of the things she's trying to resolve or kind of get through is the fact that she used to be sexually aroused by being spanked by her father. So naturally, Michael Fassbender, a.k.a. Jung, has to step in and um, help her explore these, uh, these preoccupations on her part. But it's tough to make a movie feel very dramatically compelling when you basically have a lot of guys sitting around in rooms surrounded by books, smoking pipes, discussing psychoanalysis. Like, on the page, great. As a book, yeah, great. As a screenplay, maybe it works a little better, but it doesn't have a lot of um, kind of dramatic urgency from my point of view. So very stimulating to the intellect, but maybe not very satisfying in a dramatic fashion. But I always like seeing um, Viggo Mortensen and uh, David Cronenberg work together. They obviously, they love and adore each other. They, they, like, they, they see the world very much in the same terms and they're natural collaborators and they enjoy working together. I just think they've made other movies that are more interesting. But moving right along from my number 17, we have a movie where I was, I wouldn't say bitterly disappointed when it came out, but I felt like David Cronenberg had come so close to giving us yet another like great Cronenberg classic that I felt very let down when it just didn't quite stick the landing. But Maps to the Stars from 2014. And this movie, the failure of this movie, definitely, um, I guess, like kind of stopped his career and its tracks for a couple of years because the movie cost $13 million to make, only grossed $4.5 million. And Cronenberg's had a few slumps in his career. Like he's had a lot of commercial successes, but he's also had some movies where it's like, oh, wow, like my next movie is going to be much more difficult to raise money. And yeah, Maps to the Stars really fucked up his career for a while. But it reunites him with Robert Pattinson, who's good in this. But the reason I like watching this movie is because of Julianne Moore. It's a, um, it's a social satire about Hollywood and showbiz and actors, but it's also a movie about incest and burn victims and drug abuse and ghosts and all kinds of crazy shit. It has so many good scenes, and I felt like like the potential was there for a movie with a lot of teeth to really just like skewer show business. Like it's this one scene where Julianne Moore is talking shit about an actress who might be getting a role that Julianne Moore's character really wants. Julianne Moore was sexually abused by her mother who died in a fire when she when she was very young, and now Julianne Moore wants to play her mother in a biopic about her life, but when she's talking trash about her competition, she's like, she used to let producers stick their cocks in her ass and pee. And just Julianne Moore, I mean, she has been an institution now for decades. She's one of my favorite actresses working today, and she's been given us so many great roles, but she knows wherever she speaks when it comes to the dark side of Hollywood and the dark side of showbiz. And she lives here in New York, not too far from, uh, from my neighborhood. I think she's very willfully and deliberately avoided getting sucked into the maelstrom of Hollywood. 
But God damn, if this movie had just been a little meaner, a little nastier, and had more of like a devastating finish, I think it would have been an absolute smash. But it's one of those movies where it just kind of runs out of gas. And I hadn't watched it in 10 years since it came out, but I watched it again yesterday. Well worth watching. Like We're getting into the, the movies and David Cronenberg's career that I do thoroughly enjoy, but I will concede that Maps to the Stars feels incomplete or unfinished. There's something missing that would make it the uh, the classic ghost story slash Hollywood satire that it deserves to be. But let's go ahead and push on to my number 16, Existence from 1999. And I expect I'll get some pushback for ranking this one so poorly in his overall filmography. Like to the present day, I'm constantly bumping into people like, oh my God, I love Existence. That's one of my favorite David Cronenberg movies. When I saw Existence in 1999, it was the first time that where I felt like perhaps David Cronenberg was chasing the subjects of his youth or that he was starting to get old. Because when, if you love video games and you're obsessed with video games and you watch a movie about video games, you can always tell like who are the charlatans and who are the authorities. And Cronenberg knows wherever he speaks when, he comes to, when it comes to games. Like very famously, he included a lot of joysticks on top of the TV that James Woods is basically like having sex with in video drums. Like, all right, yeah, you, you're recognizing that like, TV, technology, video games, and sex are all kind of getting stirred together. But for me, Existence just felt like Videodrome light. And it has all the, the, the usual tropes of like political radicals and all sorts of uh, you know crazy, like unreliable, uh, unreliable protagonists where you're not quite sure what's reality and what's not. But it just felt inauthentic in some ways where I guess other people watching like, oh my God, this is like the best, best movie I've ever seen about exploring virtual realities and digital settings and that sort of thing. But it's one of those movies where I've watched it a couple times and I keep waiting for that big aha moment where I'll like it as much as other David Cronenberg enthusiasts seem to, but it just eludes me. And maybe, maybe it's because of Jennifer Jason Lee and Jude Law, who from my point of view are slightly miscast. And I like those two actors quite a bit. They've done amazing work in other movies. But this leads me, I guess, to another topic where David Cronenberg spends a lot of time very carefully casting his movies because he feels like, you know, like your whole movie can fall to pieces if you don't cast it properly. And he famously has kind of a hands-off approach to directing because he feels like if you hire a professional, like they know how to give you what's on the page. But the only time he'll do a lot of directing is if an actor is inexperienced, like Deborah Harry, big giant pop star from Blondie. And when she worked with him on Videodrome, she needed a little direction to help give the performance that uh, we all know and love. Maybe Existence would be a more satisfying movie if you had some different actors in there. Who knows, but for whatever reason, the appeal of this movie has always been slightly out of my grasp, but I just know that there are a lot of people out there who absolutely love this, but I guess Cronenberg is a victim of his own success. He's done such a great job of directing so many classic horror movies and science fiction movies that when he dives into that world, you expect big things, which leads to me to uh, my number 15. We have uh, similar complaints. The Shrouds from 2025. I finally get an opportunity to talk about The Shrouds. The whole reason I'm making this video is because I was basically suffering from writer's block trying to figure out like how do I discuss The Shrouds without discussing The Shrouds since it doesn't come out for six more months. But now finally, let's discuss The Shrouds. So let's start with the positive. There's a lot to love about The Shrouds. It's a deeply personal movie. You can tell it's a film where David Cronenberg is wrestling with his own mortality. He's wrestling with the death of his wife because in the context of this film, you have this very wealthy entrepreneur who's invented this industry where you have graveyards with screens where people can watch in like, in like granular detail the slow de decomposition of their loved ones, or they can watch it on their phone, but you basically never have to let them go. And he's completely, totally infatuated with his, uh, his wife who died uh, a few years ago, who's played by Diane Kruger. And I can only imagine how much pressure Diane Kruger felt knowing that she was basically playing a role that was inspired by Carolyn uh, Cronenberg's wife who died back in 2017. But what I like about this movie is how Vincent Cassell is playing yet another basically stand-in for David Cronenberg, where he's got a lot of um, um, kind of male leads throughout his career who kind of look like Cronenberg and kind of act like Cronenberg, where same hairstyle, same fashion. And most famously on the front, you have movies like uh, Videodrome, where James Woods absolutely feels like it could be David Cronenberg just like going through his uh, his daily routine. But Vincent Cassell, he's even got Cronenberg's hairstyle on this. But this is the uh, the third time they've worked together. That's he's another great collaborator for uh, David Cronenberg, and he is fucking awesome in this. He's hysterical. This is probably one of uh, Cronenberg's funniest movies in an, un un I wouldn't say in an unintentional way, but unexpected way given the, uh, the subject of the movie. But the movie also suffers from being very heavy handed when it comes to a lot of conspiracies where you've got Chinese governments and spies and other giant tech companies that are all kind of like competing for with each other and sabotaging each other. 
And Cronenberg loves exploring that terrain. Like even a movie like Scanners, you've got big tech and governments and that sort of thing all competing kind of in this like underground Cold War. He, he loves returning to themes along those lines. But the problem with this movie is that without giving anything away, perhaps he overdoes it with the conspiracies at the expense of some of the human drama. But what's most interesting about the movie to me some of the dream sequences. And Cronenberg's given us great dream sequences in the past, like famously in Dead Ringers. There, there's one dream sequence which was so horrific, he actually cut it from the movie on purpose. But there's yet another one in there which is actually pretty good. But there's some dream sequences in here where they're wonderfully affectionate and wonderfully erotic, but also terrifying and disgusting in a lot of ways. Like uh, dream sequences that are wrestling, wrestling with the decay of the human body, and that's another thing that Cronenberg has uh, returned to repeatedly throughout his career, the way the body kind of rots and turns against itself over time, like famously explored in uh, The Fly very successfully. And we're back in similar terrain here with the relationship between Cassell and his wife played by Diane Kruger. And of course, it's always fascinating watching David Cronenberg explore the intersection between flesh and technology. Probably no filmmaker in history has ever done a better job on that front. But this is a movie where the conspiracies, let, once again, I'm, I'm tripping over. I'm, this is why I didn't do the Shrouds review initially, because I was trying to figure out how to discuss it without giving stuff away. I'll just say that the movie dissolves like a lot of other David Cronenberg movies, where like in the last 10 or 20 minutes, it just kind of fades as opposed to giving us a satisfying conclusion. But if you're a Cronenberg enthusiast, obviously you're going to have a blast watching the movie. It's just not as strong as some of his other movies, but there's nothing wrong with that. Like no, no filmmaker bats a thousand. And like they, they, sometimes they just hit a single or a double in the shrouds. It's, yeah, it was one of his singles or it's one of his doubles. But if you love his past work, you'll absolutely find yourself back on familiar footing with that movie. So from a number 14, I'm expecting some strong pushback on this one because this is a deeply personal movie to David Cronenberg. The stars and David Cronenberg gave up their salaries just to get it made because they all felt so strongly that, that the movie needed to exist. And so I feel a little guilty offering any criticisms whatsoever, but Spider from 2002. Ray Fiennes was cast in this before David Cronenberg ever came on board, and he joked that uh, no director ever directed him less than David Cronenberg on this movie. But from Cronenberg's point of view, Ray Fiennes was, was such a pro and so well prepared and such a natural for the part. He didn't need to direct him a lot. But this movie, uh, what, I guess what's a, a simple way to describe the plot. You're dealing with a schizophrenic as he's getting out of the hospital and going to a halfway house and as he's exploring his childhood and his memories. But because he's schizophrenic, his memories aren't necessarily that reliable. And David Cronenberg compounds that by having actors like Miranda Richardson play multiple roles where you're like, wait a second, is this a memory or is this a distorted memory? Like, what's going on here? But we've got Gabriel Byrne, Miranda Richardson, and Ray Fine just absolutely at the top of their game in this really gnarly domestic drama where depending upon which point of view you want to accept as the truth, Gabriel Byrne was unfaithful to his wife with a local working girl. But at some point, a grisly murder took place. But depending upon which point of view you choose to accept as reality, it's hard to know who was murdered and why, but it's an absolutely fascinating drama with a really depressing depiction of pub culture and also a really gnarly depiction of some of the um, kind of, I guess, forbidden sex that might take take place beneath the bridge if you're cheating on your wife. Like, there's this one gross scene. I'll spoil it here if you haven't seen it, but Miranda Richardson's playing a, a working girl, a professional, who's helping Gabriel Byrne get his rocks off and she's doing it with her hand, but rather than just kind of like flinging like off to the side or like wiping her hand with like a, uh, with like a handkerchief, she quite literally flings the jizz toward the camera, toward the river, and you're just like, ah, oh, no. <laughs> like, it almost feels like it was shot in 3D. So gross. But this movie famously died when it came out. It was underfunded. The distribution didn't have nearly enough marketing heft. I think it only opened in a couple theaters in America. It basically, it came and went. Like even for Cronenberg fans, they're like, "Wait a second! Like, where's Spider? I thought I thought he had a new movie." And as a result of the failure of Spider, Cronenberg felt like he needed to make like a bit of a commercial comeback with his next movie, which was *A History of Violence*, which was a very successful commercial comeback for him. But Spider, it's definitely one of those doomed passion projects, which has a lot of artistic integrity. But if you find it to be a little slow and depressing, you will not be alone on that front. I mean, it, this, it is, I won't say it's a slog to get through, but you're like, I'm in misery and it feels much, feels much longer than its very tight economical length would suggest. But if you like Ray Fiennes, Gabriel Byrne, and Miranda Richardson, then you absolutely owe it to yourself to give it a go. 
And after you've watched it once, if you're feeling very charitable and forgiving, watch it again, because I think I've seen it now twice. I definitely liked it more the second time through, so it's growing on me. Who knows, if I do this list again at the end of David Cronenberg's life, maybe Spider will climb the ranks and make it into the top 10. And also I should add that Spider is based on a book by Patrick McGrath, so it's further evidence that David Cronenberg does love to do the occasional literary fiction adaptation, and he's pretty goddamn good at it. But my voice is already starting to fail, and we haven't even gotten to the top 10 yet, so let's push on. Number 13, Crimes of the Future from 2022. And I still can't quite tell if I like this movie because of what it represents or if I like this movie because I like this movie because it has so many ingredients that I really like. I mean, it's got this really disgusting vision of the future where people are starting to, I guess, evolve in surprising, almost kind of radical ways where like they're gonna live off toxic waste and plastic and that sort of thing. Like maybe that's like humanity's way of adapting to an overly polluted future where we need to eat our own waste almost to kind of purify the planet. It's also got the lovely Leia Seydoux, one of my favorite working actresses today, who is not afraid to strip down for some interesting, um, how can I say this? Like I like the blend of science fiction and erotica, and no one does that better than David Cronenberg. And there's a scene where um, Viggo Mortensen's almost, you can't quite tell if this is like foreplay or a scientific experimentation or artistic expression, but she's laid out in all of her glory while he's operating this machine that's kind of like poking and slicing her in every way. And they end up kind of cuddling and getting completely dismembered together. It is some really sick, fucked up shit. But like, I like seeing that kind of stuff in movies, but like, is it well done? Or am I just responding because I want to see more of that in movies? But I love this vision of the future where like, like humanity is starting to change and how like nobody washes their hands anymore and like nobody feels pain anymore. Everybody's starting to change and like people's notions of sex is starting to change. As, as I famously said, or as Kristen Stewart famously says in the movie, surgery is the new sex. And at one point, Viggo Morrison even jokes about how he's not very good at the old sex. And Cronenberg is always preoccupied with this idea of like, what is the new sex? What is the new flesh? Like death the video drum, long live the new flesh. It's, a, it's a, a topic he keeps returning to throughout his career. And I like how David Cronenberg says with this movie, he didn't really have like a clear agenda that he wanted to kind of like sell to people. He just has, as a filmmaker and as a creator, certain time, certain images will come into his, into his brain and he wants to share those images with people. And this movie has some striking imagery where Maybe he doesn't even know what the goal, the purposes of this movie was, but he just wanted everybody to wrestle with these ideas right alongside him. And it's got some great humor in there as well. Like Leia Seydoux is very turned on by zippers. And at one point, Viggo Mortensen, who keeps growing all these um, superfluous organs that are basically tattooed and laid out as like art exhibits, he basically gets like a zipper installed <laughs> to give easy access to his organs. And Leia Seydoux unzips them and she's licking his insides and he's as careful don't spill. And that just made me roll out of my chair with laughter. So I love seeing Viggo Mortensen and David Cronenberg working together. I love seeing them explore science fiction and the future and sex and all sorts of crazy stuff. I'm not quite sure that the movie's as good as I would like it to be, but I've seen it twice now. I like it. I'm sure I'll continue to watch it, but I feel like after such a long, uh, long period away from the movies where after, um, uh, Maps to the Stars kind of derailed his career. It was just a thrill to see David Cronenberg back on firm footing, back in the back in the terrain that he likes to explore. So high five to uh, to Neons for supporting this movie. And obviously, without Crimes of the Future, we don't get the shrouds. And you know, he's 81 years old. I don't know if he'll make more movies. Hopefully, he'll give us a few more before his uh, career draws to a close. But at least he gave us one last, you know, fantastic body horror, science fiction horror film, just to remind everybody that in spite of all the imitators that have emerged in recent years, there ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. But next up, number 12, Naked Lunch or Naked Lunch. I say naked because of just that's the way I was raised, but I know most people say naked, but Naked Lunch, 1991. This gave uh, Cronenberg a chance to adapt one of the books by one of his literary heroes, William S. Burroughs. I always get the sense that Cronenberg looks up to literary icons with far more affection than he does with filmmaking icons. While he'll like tip his hat to people like Fellini, who he, re who he really likes, but like authors like Vladimir Nabokov or authors like William S. Burroughs, they really seem to do it for him. And this is more an adaptation about the writing of Naked Lunch as opposed to a strict adaptation. I read the book about 20 years ago and found it to have uh, delicious imagery, but almost indecipherable or impenetrable from my, um, from, my, from my vantage point. But it has maybe the best goddamn trailer for any movie ever where you have William S. Burroughs 
like basically teeing up the concept and how controversial the novel was in the late 50s and how it was being burned and you know banned and all that kind of stuff. Well, it came out in 1959, and it found an audience. Town meetings, book burnings, and an inquiry by the state Supreme Court. That book made quite a little impression. And, and just to give you a taste of why the book was considered so shocking back in the day and why I find it to be so impenetrable, here's a little taste from uh, William Burroughs' Naked Lunch. Uh, where should I start? Uh, he jerks her to her feet and tightens the noose. He sticks his cock up her and waltzes around the platform and off into space, swinging in a great arc. Whee! He screams, turning into Johnny. Her neck snaps. A great fluid wave undulates through her body. Johnny drops to the floor and stands poised and alert like a young animal. He leaps about the room with a scream of longing that shatters the glass wall. He leaps out into space, masturbating end over end, 3,000 feet down, his sperm floating beside him. He screams all the way against the shattering blue of sky, the rising sun burning over his body like gasoline. I mean, it just goes on and on. But you're like, what in the name of fuck is, is, is going on here? But you can uh, definitely understand why David Cronenberg is drawn to that material. But I will say this. Peter Weller, he's, uh, he's really goddamn good. He looks like William S. Burroughs. He just, he, like, it's, everything about him just uh, fits the part to a T. And I love all the uh, hallucinatory explorations of drugs. Obviously, William S. Burroughs was really into drugs. He also wrote a book called uh, Junkie, which I got right here. This is actually much more easy to read. And, of course, he's got his book Queer, which just recently got adapted by um, Luca Guadagnino, which I also saw at the New York Film Festival. So William S. Burroughs, he's still being adapted. He's still in the mix. But... Once again, getting back to Naked Lunch, maybe I shouldn't rank it so highly because I, I understand it so poorly, but there's something about the imagery that's so striking that like once you've seen it, you can't get out of your brain. And I first saw it like on VHS when I was like 16 or 17 because I like Peter Weller from RoboCop. And I was like, what the fuck is this? I had no idea who David Cronenberg was at that time. I wouldn't know him by name until like a year or two later. But every once in a while, I do enjoy being challenged by thought-provoking cinema or cinema that I find to be indecipherable or cinema where there's no you know, logical answers to, uh, to your questions. And so Naked Lunch, Naked Lunch is that movie for me and David Cronenberg's overall filmography. But let's move on to my number 11, A History of Violence from 2005, which very much felt like a major comeback for David Cronenberg because Existence, were, for me, had been unsatisfying. Spider actually missed in the theater. It kind of came and went so quickly, I was like, wait, where did it go? But when A History of Violence came out, I was like, fuck yeah, David Cronenberg is going to like be back on firm footing make a nice juicy commercial film that's much more accessible to most people and it opened the door to Eastern Promises. And there's something about that, that, that double feature or that like the one-two punch of a history of violence and Eastern Promises. They almost feel like kind of the same movie in the same way because they both star Viggo Mortensen. And in my top 10 list, I'm always changing which one is ranked before the other. Some days I feel like a history of violence is better. Some days I feel like Eastern Promises is better. For the purposes of this list, Eastern Promises is going to be number 10. But A History of Violence, it just fucking works. It's an incredibly satisfying, emotionally engaging movie filled with all kinds of uh, interesting commentary on violence while at the same time allowing us to revel in the violence and find it thrilling and exciting because Viggo Mortensen plays a uh, basically like an old killer for hire who worked for the mob whose past comes back to haunt him. But anytime uh, Joey relies upon his old skills, it's fucking thrilling to watch because this is goddamn Aragorn himself just beating the fuck out of people in this small town and going to war with the mob. I like it. <laughs> and I also have to give a shout out to actress Maria Bello, who is fucking incredible incredible in this movie and one of the most interesting depictions of married sex that I've ever seen is in a history of violence where she basically says to him like well we never got to have like our high school prom experiences we never got to have like all those early formative experiences together that a lot of people in this small town do and so what she decides to do is basically recreate the emotions or the drama that they would have experienced in high school if he had grown up there and not come there in hiding many years later like under an assumed identity 
She dresses up as the cheerleader form, and it is so sexy and so erotic. I'm unmarried, but my understanding is that for some people, when they've been married for a long time, you know, the, the thrill is gone. They're not that interested in um, kind of exploring new sexual terrain together. This movie absolutely is interested in exploring new sexual terrain together, oftentimes very violently later on in the movie with some of the most upsetting, disturbing sexuality that we've seen in David Cronenberg's career. But early on, I was like, whoa, Maria Bello. Yeah, all right. You got it going on, honey. But the movie's also got Ed Harris in an incredible role. We got William Hurt in a pretty good role. Not as good as Ed Harris's role, but this movie is very entertaining. I won't claim it's one of Cronenberg's best movies, but it basically opened the door to Cronenberg having like the, the second half of his career. The ability to continue to make movies because it wasn't like a, a colossal smash. Uh, the budget was $32 million, The box office was $61.4 million, But it was just enough to show that David Cronenberg still got some juice left in the tank or some gas left in the tank. Let's give him another a few more turns at bat, and that's what allowed him basically to remain active for another 10 years before his hiatus and then his comeback with the Crimes of the Future. Seems like he's always having these periods where he'll kind of have a slump and then a big comeback, and a slump and a big comeback. But uh, I admire his resilience, but my voice is almost gone, and we finally have arrived at the top 10 list. Let's... Let's get our game face on and dive right in with uh, both feet for uh, number 10, Eastern Promises from 2007. So here's the official premise ripped straight from Wikipedia. A 2007 British-Canadian gangster film directed by David Cronenberg from a screenplay by Stephen Knight. The film tells the story of Anna, Naomi Watts, a Russian-British midwife who delivers the baby of a drug-addicted 14-year-old trafficked Ukrainian girl who dies in childbirth. After Anna learns that the teen was forced into prostitution by the Russian mafia in London, the leader of the Russian gangsters, Armin mueller stahl threatens the baby's life and Anna is warned off by his menacing henchman, Vigo Mortensen. And I guess that's a good enough for like the hook, but what's fascinating is seeing how, like, like, I never know if I should do spoilers or not when I'm doing a um, kind of a career overview, but let's just say Viggo Mortensen plays a, an enforcer or a driver or a hitman or just he's hired muscle who might have his own agenda, but he's very quickly climbing the ranks. And I just love the, uh, what feels like a very gritty, authentic portrayal of a Russian crime family set in London when it comes to the food and the culture and how they conduct their affairs and just how, like, what a, an absolutely fucking ruthless environment these, uh, these characters operate within, especially when you see kind of the, the initiation ritual for Viggo Mortensen's character after he basically gets accepted into the higher ranks. When it comes to like, like his oaths of fealty and the tattoos and all that stuff, but this is a movie that just pulls absolutely, absolutely no punches. Vincent Cassell is absolutely incredible in it. But I guess I wonder, would this movie have the reputation that it has if it didn't have that Turkish bath sequence where I think it's some um, Chechnyan hitmen or Chechnyan assassins who come to kill Viggo Mortensen and he's sitting there in his towel and just the way God made him, the towel gets thrown aside and he goes to war with these two guys with his ding dong flapping around every step of the way. And apparently it was Viggo Mortensen who said to Cronenberg early on in the uh, the development process, I guess there's no really no way to shoot this scene unless I'm completely naked because I felt like for a movie that's trying so hard to be authentic, it would be hard to remain authentic if you were using like clever framing or disguising the fact that he was naked, like only shooting from advantageous angles. So here we are, Aragorn himself, only four years after the return of the king, letting everybody know what Ar Arwen was enjoying on their wedding night down in uh, Minas Tirith. I mean, when I saw this movie in the theater, I was just like screaming and laughing just at the audacity and just how outrageous that entire sequence was. And that holds true for pretty much every other movie on this list moving forward, where you have actors who are great dance partners for David Cronenberg, where they're game for anything, they have an appetite for risk, for adventure, for exploring new possibilities, for exploring new terrain. And that leads me to my number nine, a movie which has actually kind of climbed the ranks a bit in recent years for me. Pray it doesn't happen to you. Rabid. Rabid from 1977. And I, the older I get, I've, I've noticed a, um, a certain trend in my tastes as they evolve. I'm less concerned with trying to have, I guess, the, um, the artistic integrity of celebrating really sophisticated films. And I'm just being honest about the fact that if you make a, you know, a gnarly horror film about a vampire with a needle in her armpit played by the world's most glamorous and most famous porn star, like, that's pretty much all you need and you're off to the races with a pretty uh, dynamite exploitation film or grindhouse movie, however you want to describe it. But 
Marilyn Chambers just fucking goes for it. And while she might be inexperienced as an actress in the, in the, in the context of doing like, you know, kind of like legitimate film, she had uh, made a big splash with the movie Behind the Green Door, a porn film which David Cronenberg claims that he never saw. I've seen all the highlights. It's uh, well worth hunting down, but obviously Marilyn Chambers made a huge career for herself making adult entertainment, which actually makes her a natural for this role where you have a beautiful woman seducing people or attacking people and then inadvertently, unbeknownst to her, spreading this rabid disease because while she's feeding off people, what she doesn't know is that every time she feeds off somebody, they basically turn into these rabid fucking cannibalistic zombies going on a rampage. So she's just leaving a path of destruction in her wake wherever she goes. And I love this uh, one story from behind the scenes where uh, at one point during the shooting, David Cronenberg woke up and told his friend John Dunning, I just woke up this morning and realized this is nuts. Do you know what this movie's about? This woman grows a cock thing in her armpit and sucks people's blood through it. It's ridiculous. I can't do this. It's not going to work. Luckily, that crisis of faith, uh, it was short-lived, and he continued with the movie, and it went on to become a relatively successful movie. It was one one of the highest-grossing Canadian films of all time at the time of its release, and it's got some absolutely striking imagery. It has one of my favorite shots in the history of the horror genre, where Marilyn Chambers, she has just been to a porn theater with a guy that she, uh, she drained him dry during the movie, and as she's leaving and walking down this uh, main drag of the street, She's wearing this fur coat and looking stunningly gorgeous. And she walks by another theater where you've got a poster for Carrie in the window. And what's interesting is how Carrie stars Sissy Spacek, who was the original actress that uh, David Cronenberg had in mind to be the star of Rabbit. She had not yet made Carrie at that time. She'd only made Badlands, which he absolutely loved her. I mean, she'd made other stuff like, um, what the hell is that movie that with uh, Lee Marvin? Uh, uh, shit. Prime Cut, I had to look it up, but yeah, Prime Cut, well worth hunting down, but Sissy Spacek, because of her freckles and because of her Texan accent, they were reluctant to uh, let David Cronenberg cast her in Rabbit, so he went with Marilyn Chambers, who was eager to uh, have a, a bit of a, a career pivot, but she just, because of her career in the adult entertainment industry, she's very, um, I guess, um, she's very unselfconscious in the use of her body, whether she's lying around, on the, writhing around on the floor, or seducing men, or whatever the case might be, so yeah, I think more hard directors should uh, employ adult entertainers because they will gladly go to the wild side in ways that more legitimate actresses might be reluctant to do. But next up, we have the film that really got the whole David Cronenberg phenomenon like fully underway. My number eight, Shivers from 1975, also known as The Parasite Murders, also known as They Came From Within. Probably the most Cronenbergian title for any Cronenberg film, They Came From Within. It just sums up his whole career. Uh, I think the original script was called The Orgy of the Blood Parasites. And you might have, I mean, you could have just as easily called the movie like Attack of the Slithering Penises because you basically have a movie where these disgusting little parasites covered in veins and whatnot crawl around, get inside people, and turn them into sex crazed maniacs so they can continue to spread the, ep the epidemic. The movie was shot in only two weeks. It's a, a rare taxpayer-paid movie in Canada that actually returned a profit. So naturally, because it was successful, everybody was you know, criticizing it left and right for the um, for what their tax tax dollars were going toward. It's like, well, you got all of you got paid back, so uh, so don't worry about it. But I think Shivers is absolutely fucking fantastic. And one of my favorite stories about the making of, one of many favorite stories, is that when Cinepix, who was considering distributing the movie, met with David Cronenberg, they had a, um, a history of uh, distributing a lot of kind of softcore erotic movies. They said to David Cronenberg, we see that your films are very sexual, but we're just not quite sure what kind of sex. And I feel like, feel like that's the best way to describe David Cronenberg's entire career. They're very sexual, but we're just not quite sure what kind of sex. He tells me that even old flesh is erotic flesh. That disease is the love of two alien kinds of creatures for each other. That even dying is an act of eroticism. And this movie does a brilliant job of combining sex and horror throughout the movie, especially like in that early scene where you see a doctor where he knows what's going on, but we, the audience, don't know what's going on yet. But we see him like opening up a girl and pouring acid in her to get, trying to kill the epidemic before it spreads too far. But it is, it's simultaneously arousing because the beautiful young lady lying on the table, but horrifying all at once. You're like, I, I love that like, when your brain doesn't quite know how to compute what it's seeing on the screen and slowly but surely become to realize what's going down. And also I like how this movie's got like some of the best scenes when it comes to Cronenberg's kind of signature clinical medical horror 
when we have two doctors sitting down early on talking about how they've been developing this parasite as basically a way of like replacing certain organs. If, a, if an organ has failed, well then perhaps a parasite that drinks a little blood might be just as good at like providing the role that that organ played if the organ's no longer any use to that person. You breed a parasite, you implant in the, in the human body cavity, and it hooks into the circulatory system, and it filters the blood just like a kidney does. And so it takes a little blood for itself once in a while. What do you care? I mean, you got enough. You can afford to be generous. Yeah, it's one of the quintessential David Cronenberg films, and I feel like all of his preoccupations on display in this movie, which, which once again, he shot it in two weeks. This is a movie with special effects, violence, gore, all kinds of crazy shit. How he shot it in two weeks absolutely blows my goddamn mind, but it is one of the best... I mean, I guess it's not his feature film debut, but it's his commercial feature film debut. It's one of the best debuts by a filmmaker in filmmaking history, and everybody definitely owes it to themselves to give it a look. But from a lucky number seven, we get to step into the world of Stephen King with one of the best adaptations of Stephen King's books that I've ever seen, The Dead Zone from 1983. Do I have it up on my wall? Nope, I must have put it somewhere else. I've got a few Stephen King books up there, but anyway, I'll, I love Stephen King's books, specifically the, the books from like the late 70s to the early 90s. Because while David Cronenberg was you know, making history with all sorts of killer movies during that time, Stephen King was also making history with all of his books from that time period. It was a great time to be a fan of the horror genre, whether you went to the video store or just to your drugstore. Like the drugstore, the grocery store would have racks upon racks of horror novels, and the video store had racks upon racks of horror movies. It was a hell of a time to be alive. And The Dead Zone, I would say, alongside like Stand By Me and The Shawshank Redemption and The Shining, and Carrie. It's definitely one of the best movies or shows ever made from the books of Stephen King. And it came along at the perfect time because while it was being shot, uh, Videodrome came out and flopped, and flopped hard. And luckily, David Cronenberg had already agreed to do this uh, much more commercial, much more accessible movie. And I'm not trying to criticize The Dead Zone, but it's a less personal movie than Videodrome. But luckily, like as they always say, book your next gig before your current movie comes out because you never know if your movie fails, at least then you'll continue to be gainfully employed. But the movie has such a fantastic, simple premise where Christopher Walken's character wakes up from a coma with the ability to see the future, like in brief brief visions, if he touches somebody or touches one of their possessions. But the flip side is that every time he uses his power, takes a little bit out of him. Like he's uh, he's all fucked up from this uh, this car accident he was in. But every time he uses his powers, he gets a little bit worse and a little bit weaker. But also it's like he knows he can do some good if he uses his ability. Like repeatedly over and over and over again, he saves people's lives or helps solve murder mysteries. And now he's faced with this conundrum if you could go back in time and prevent World War II by killing Hitler as a baby, like, would you do so? Because he knows that World War III is coming. Martin Sheen's character plays this total megalomaniacal, megal, megalomaniacal politician who's very compelling and very attractive now, but he's also very dangerous. And in the future, he will bring about World War III and say hallelujah as he does it. But I just fucking love this movie. Christopher Walken is just on fire. I mean, the, most famously now, people just love that scene where he's trying to warn a father that if they go out onto this pond and play a game of pond hockey, that in his own words... Now, don't give me any argument. The ice is gonna break! But the way he delivers that is just like, yes, yeah, pure fire. Christopher Walken doing his best. But like, Tom Skerritt's really good in this as well. The movie almost becomes like a, a great like superhero movie briefly where he's employed by the cops to try to solve a series of grisly murders. And this is when the movie really goes to the dark side, when you see just like how this killer operates, who his collaborators are, whatever his techniques, and then how he chooses to end his own life. It is horrific, but so goddamn compelling, so fucking fun to watch. I love The Dead Zone. I've seen it over and over and over again. It's definitely one of the most entertaining horror movies of the 1980s. If you've not watched it in a while, definitely check it out. Hang on one sec. I'm seeing um, some notes here. Oh, Cronenberg received five scripts for the film, including one from Stephen King himself, which he described as the worst one by far. That's hilarious. It's funny how Stephen King sometimes has a troubled relationship with the best adaptations of his books because famously he hated the way uh, Stanley Kubrick changed The Shining. But then when Stephen King finally got a chance to do a TV show from The Shining years later, it was atrocious. Like it might have been more faithful to, to the book, but just absolutely 
unwatchable, just laughably, laughably stupid. It came out in the late 90s. Hunt it down if you, uh, if you doubt me. But I feel like whether you're talking about Kubrick with The Shining or Cronenberg with The Dead Zone or uh, Brian De Palma with Carrie, like luckily Stephen King did... His work did attract the, the interest of some of the best filmmakers at that time. So we've got some great adaptations, irrespective of what, of what Stephen King might think of uh, their handling. But it's time to push on to my number six, Scanners from 1981. I would like to scan all of you in this room, one at a time. Which in a lot of ways is like the best X-Men movie ever made that's not called X-Men because you're dealing with all these telepaths or scanners who have all these abilities that are a natural mutation due to a drug that their um, their parents were exposed to. And it's definitely, it's probably got the most convincing telepathic combat that I've ever seen on screen. Daryl Revick, the great Michael Ironside, he's uh, an incredible villain. I mean, maybe the best villain out of all of David Cronenberg's movies. My only real criticism of this movie, and I hate to say this because I like the movie quite a bit and it's going to sound mean, but I don't like the actor who plays, hang on, opening up IMDb. I don't like actor Stephen Lack as Cameron Vale. I, I feel like he's a little flat, he's a little wooden. Like if you compare him to Christopher Walken in The Dead Zone or you compare him to uh, James Woods in Videodrome, like, dude, like, like it's, it's a fucking mess. And also Michael Ironside's so goddamn good, he just kind of blasts Stephen Lack right off the screen. But luckily Patrick McGuhan's in there, he's incredible. I feel like this is one of the best early examples of a movie which understands where if the actors take the subject seriously and the filmmaker takes the subject seriously, it just makes something like telepaths and scanners so much more compelling and so much more believable. An approach which is perfectly exemplified by arguably the most famous scene in the movie where Michael Ironside just blows the dude's head off with the power of his brain. It is absolutely glorious. And then, of course, at the end of the movie, when the, they're finally throwing down and like all the veins are bulging up and their eyes are turning white, it's like, this is... Like just pure, raw, sci-fi horror. It's like as good as it gets. Oh, who's the actress in here? Oh, yeah, Jennifer O'Neill. She's fucking fantastic in it as well. Like, this is just good old-fashioned genre cinema at its best. And I think when it came out, it was the most successful movie in the North America. I think it was, no, here's the distinction. It was the first Canadian movie to be number one at the North American box office. So luckily, it was recognized for what it was at the time. And it opened the door to Cronenberg making one of his best movies, Videodrome, which sadly failed utterly. But you need a few hits every now and then just to remind everybody you are a, a viable commercial filmmaker. But like I said, I think it's only got one real flaw to speak of, but uh, it's been in my collection, my physical media library for years. That'll never change. But it's time to get into the top five, and we're going to start with yet another movie in my physical media library, Crash, which I own on Blu-ray. I do need to get a scanner's Blu-ray, but Crash I have on Blu-ray. I love and adore Crash. It's got its flaws. Like I think this is yet another Cronenberg movie which just kind of collapses at the end as supposed to giving us a great climax. Maybe Cronenberg just looks at the end of his movies in a completely different way that's unfamiliar to me, but I feel like a movie doesn't necessarily need to end with a bang, but it needs to end on a moment of like devastating emotional power like a movie like The Brood does. But everything else in Crash, I absolutely love and adore. But it must be said, not everybody felt that way upon its initial release. When it came out at the Cannes Film Festival, according to David Cronenberg, it was due to Francis Ford Coppola, who torpedoed its chances of winning the uh, the Golden Palm, or he was just completely, totally, adamantly opposed to it. I don't know if that was like a professional rivalry, or if he was just like morally repulsed by the uh, by the themes and the subject matter of the movie. But it is based on J. G. Ballard's 1973 novel of the same name, and it basically explores this kind of like almost like like, how can I say this? It explores the lives of these people who come together where they almost resemble like like a terrorist sect organization that's living totally off the radar, totally off the reservation, but they're described as symphorophiliacs, if I'm saying that uh, correctly, but in essence, people who are aroused by car crashes and they try to rekindle uh, that experience or get their juices flowing by either watching car crashes or participating in car crashes. And the, uh, the main character, James Spader, he comes to that realization when he and Holly Hunter crash. Holly Hunter's husband is killed in the crash. James Spader spends, uh, you know, weeks, if not months, recovering. But goddamn, like the way this movie kind of like loving, lovingly and fetishistically explores even just like the healing process of all like the screws and bolts going into the body and how that can be erotic and arousing in some ways. 
or the character played by Rosanna Arquette, where she's like gone to the edge of the abyss and gazed into it so many times, her entire body now is basically held together with like screws and like, you know, pins and armor. Like she can't even walk without this elaborate kind of like Iron Man suit to kind of keep her going. But in one of the most erotic scenes of the movie, she and James Spader go car shopping and like, you know, they're like, they're checking it out. Like they're, they're loving everything about it. this is their foreplay before they're going to properly get it on and a really disturbing scene after that. But I just love the way like they're teasing the car salesman and the way that he's both embarrassed and turned on and horrified when one of her bolts or screws gets stuck in the leather of one of the seats. It's, it's an incredible scene. Oh, shit. Fuck. This is bad. This is really bad. But Deborah Cara Unger, oh my God, she is just sex on wheels in this movie. But so is Holly Hunter. I mean, early on when they have that initial crash between James Spader and Holly Hunter, while they're still suffering from the injuries, we see that she's already turned on and exposing her breasts. I mean, it is very forbidden, verboten territory that's being explored. But that's why David Cronenberg is David Cronenberg. He's willing to go there. And I feel like our, our guide, our, our spiritual guru, kind of like, like taking us by the hand through this forbidden world is the character played by Elias Codius, who's so shady and so sketchy, but at the same time, so seductive and charismatic. But he's a very dangerous, kind of threatening person in a lot of ways. But when we first see him uh, kind of prowling the hallway at this hospital and like the uniform that he's wearing, it's like it's, like it's dirty and filthy and his shirt's untucked. You can just tell this guy is uh, fucked up in many ways. But he also is uh, has certain leadership qualities, and he uh, keeps kind of attracting people to his cause. And what's interesting to me is how, in spite of the fact that I, I have no personal overlap whatsoever between my own fetishes and the fetishes explored in this movie, but because of the movie's just completely daring, unflinching, fearless exploration of that kind of fetishistic world, it makes you wonder, like, all right, well, who would be a good filmmaker to explore some other forbidden worlds or some other forbidden fetishes and that sort of thing? And this is why David Cronenberg is uh, one of the most beloved filmmakers alive today is because he is willing to risk his reputation and his career making these kinds of movies. So if you don't own it, definitely pick up the Criterion Blu-ray, but it's time to push on to one of his biggest successes, maybe his biggest success of his career, and one of his most beloved movies, a movie which I regard as a true horror classic, in a lot of ways, a perfect movie, The Fly from 1986. Sorry, I have three other interviews to do before this party's over. Yeah, but they're not working on something that'll change the world as we know it. They say they are. Yeah, but they're lying. And I feel like I got very lucky having The Fly be the very first movie by David Cronenberg that I ever saw because it's like this great operatic tragic love story in addition to being an incredible horror film. And also, it should be said, it's a remake. I'm very critical of remakes these days and how there are too many of them and they're soulless and they're dead inside. This is one of those movies that proves you can actually remake a movie and come up with absolute creative and commercial gold. Another example would be a movie like The Thing by John Carpenter. It was a flop at, its, at, at the time, but it's John Carpenter's best movie. Or even a remake like The Blob in the late 80s. Like in the 80s, for whatever reason, horror movies, the, the remakes of like classic movies from the 50s were very solid. Or maybe it's just because I saw them when I was very, very young. But what I think elevates The Fly above just being this horrible scenario where a scientist is slowly but surely you know, having his body transform and turn against itself and pieces are falling off. And it's just like the, the worst nightmare imaginable. But because Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis were in love and dating at the time, it just it transcends the, the the trappings of the horror genre and becomes, like I said, an operatic tragic love story of almost like Shakespearean gravitas. And it just makes the movie so much more emotionally compelling that it works in such a satisfying way and that it has such a great tragic ending at the end in terms of how, the, how um, their relationship is ultimately resolved with him just like putting the gun against his head and uh, begging her without words because he's lost the ability to speak, begging her to put him out of his misery. It's absolutely devastating. And while Jeff Goldblum's had a lot of great roles throughout his life, can you think of a better role that's employed that kind of maniacal, strange, barely contained energy and intelligence that he has? And I feel like David Cronenberg always benefits when he has an actor who have obviously emotional intelligence, but also real mental intelligence. He's got a very quick brain and he uh, brings that dialogue to life beautifully, even if he's just saying things like, Hamburger, or cheeseburger. Hammer feels a hamburger or cheeseburger, but that's what he wants to go out and have for uh, for lunch with uh, Gina Davis. But also the movie's like it's wonderfully erotic. Like when you see after he's first transformed, even though he doesn't know he's transforming, 
he thinks he's like discovered the fountain of youth and he's insatiable when it comes to uh, his, uh, his appetite for sex and that sort of thing. And like he brings that girl home from the bar and he's like, he picks her up and he's just, like running up the stairs. Like it's fucking business time. He's ready to throw down. But also this movie reminds me of a, a famous anecdote where when Martin Scorsese met David Cronenberg, he was very intimidated. He didn't quite know what to expect. And when he met him, he's like, you look like a Beverly Hills gynecologist. And it's very fitting because when you see him in his lab coat in the dream sequence in the fly, delivering that writhing larva, I mean, that about made my dad die then and there. When he was like, oh, what are we watching? <laughs> But when you see him in that with like the, the mask and the lab coat, he does look like a Beverly Hills gynecologist. And it's very prophetic that Scorsese would say so because he obviously, uh, David Cronenberg would make a movie about gynecology a few short years after The Fly. And also I should add that one of my all-time favorite filmmakers from quite a different genre, Mel Brooks, was one of the producers on this movie. And there's this great anecdote where uh, David Cronenberg was showing the movie to Mel and there's a scene where Jeff Goldblum's walking down the sidewalk and Howard Shore's like his operatic score is just blasting. And Mel's like, what's happening? Why is the music so thunderous? And Cronenberg was like, oh, well, he's, he's, like, he's got a, like a meeting with destiny. Or he had some kind of bullshit explanation, but the reality was he just needed something to kind of get, get the movie going. I, I feel like that Howard Shore score really gives this movie this incredible engine where just like, it gives the movie this pr propulsive momentum. But Mel Brooks, you really can't say enough about his taste as a producer because while he was making great comedy classics like Blazing Saddles or Young Frankenstein or the original producers, he was also producing movies like The Elephant Man and The Fly. So Mel Brooks, when, when he dies, I will cry for the rest of my life. But speaking of crying for the rest of my life, I'm going to start weeping from fatigue if I don't uh, move on with this video. So enough about The Fly. It's one of my all-time favorite horror movies. It's fucking perfect. I love and adore it. But I just don't love and adore it quite as much as the next three movies on my list. So from my number three, we got The Brood from 1979. So for my money, The Brood might be the most raw personal horror film ever made by a filmmaker in any era because famously it's inspired by a very acrimonious divorce that he was going through with a very acrimonious child custody battle. Because according to a story that I heard that while he was going through this horrible custody battle with his ex-wife, he traveled to California where his wife had basically joined a cult or this hippie commune. Like some hippie communes and cults have a little bit of overlap. But he retrieved his daughter from that cult, much like the uh, the retrieval of the daughter from the brood at the end of the brood. I'm like, oh my god! It just it just shows how sometimes the best stories come from a, a personal place. And David Cronenberg had this incredible line where he said that uh, he found the shooting of the climactic scene in which Nola was strangled by her husband to be quote unquote very satisfying. I mean. You want to talk about being um, perhaps too honest when <laughs> discussing your movies, but the character of Nola Carveth, Mother of the Brood, is based on um, the mother of uh, Coppola, uh, not Coppola, Cronenberg's daughter, Cassandra. But what brings her to life so vividly and so compellingly is actress Samantha Egger. Do I have her? Yeah, Samantha Egger. Holy shit. I mean, this is one of the most raw, ferocious, and eerie performances in the history of the horror genre. Like, er every line she delivers is like, to absolute perfection. Even at one point, when she calls her uh, her husband's house and another woman answers, she's babysitting the daughter, and her transition from that eerie personality to complete and total rage is just absolutely fucking horrifying. Are you and my husband having your own private PTA meeting, Miss Mayor? I won't even bother to answer that. You bitch! You're killing my family! You bitch! And just watching like the, the like the, the ebb and flow and the ups and downs and the crescendos and decrescendos of her emotion toward the end of the movie when she reveals where the brood is coming from and almost like a like a like a mother dog, like looking after a young and like peeling the skin off a baby. It is one of the best performances in the history of the horror genre. Nothing else comes close. Uh, but Oliver Reed is pretty goddamn good in here as well as the doctor who's um, putting forth these uh, these studies in psychoplasmics where he's trying to have people like externalize their in their internal trauma, which leads to all sorts of like disgusting cancerous tumors growing on their skin and that sort of thing. Oh. Hmm. Do you like it? I do. That's Raglan. That's psychoplasmics. <laughs> it's called lymphosarcoma. And it's spreading. This is just some diabolical stuff here where 
Cronenberg's medical or scientific background is being brought to the forefront, but also his personal experiences are being brought to the forefront. It is a masterclass in delivering horror gold for very little money. He shot it for 1.4 million Canadian dollars and ended up grossing $5 million. And also should acknowledge this was the first movie where David Cronenberg worked with uh, Howard Shore. And as I said before, Howard Shore scored 16 of Cronenberg's movies. I think a lot of Cronenberg's success is owed to Howard Shore, who's done good work for other filmmakers. Like he did the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Howard Shore knows what he's doing, but goddamn, like the, the Brood and fucking Scanners and Videodrome, none of these movies would be what they are without Howard Shore's astonishing music. But also we have to give credit where credit is due with just Cronenberg's eye. I mean, one of the most eerie... I guess, how do I describe it? Like, it, it should, in theory, be like a nothing shot, but watching the daughter walking along the snow-filled highway, holding hands with two of the brood, bone chilling. I just absolutely eat that shit up. I could watch it every day, like, the rest of my life, and probably fall under its spell each and every single time. I love it, or like great moments, like when we see um, one of the brood holding her fingers around a banister, and she's like, ah! retreats, leaves the bloody f fingerprints. It's so fucking cool, so subtle, so well done. I love it. But as I said before, I just don't love it quite as much as what's to come. So let's push on to number two, Videodrome. Death to Videodrome, long live the new flesh. Videodrome. Videodrome, starring Deborah Harry and James Woods. A shocking new vision from the creator of Scanners. Coming soon to a theater near you from Universal Pictures. Now, it's difficult to sum up in just a few minutes how much this movie's meant to me over the years, but I've definitely seen it more than any other Cronenberg movie. It probably would be number one if not for the fact that I'm a little... I'm a little soft on the very end of the movie where I feel like, once again, it just kind of dissolves and Cronenberg famously struggled with the ending quite a bit. But everything else is a one-of-a-kind fucking masterpiece. And maybe I shouldn't acknowledge this or admit this, but the story of Max Wren and Civic TV and looking for snuff films and that sort of thing and his eventual encounter with uh, Nicky Brand... It did have an impact on me sexually at that time. Not that I was ever into sadomasochism, nor that I ever get into sadomasochism, but there's, but there's an incredible scene where early on she says to him, do you want to try some things? And the way she says it, it's so seductive and so terrifying. Like she's got experiences and knowledge and expertise and like things she's willing to explore and try that perhaps might be a little terrifying for Max, but he obviously is willing to kind of meet her halfway and explore some things with her. But something about that idea at that time, I think prior to that, I just, I thought of sex in very traditional kind of, you know, missionary kind of um, like a missionary context where it's pretty much like meat and potatoes, but it never even occurred to me that there were like oceans of new experiences to, uh, to be explored. The same way that there are oceans of new cinematic experiences to be explored. You can basically, if you want to, want to spend years, devote years of your life to it, you could watch 10,000 brilliant movies from you know, every era of history and have all sorts of crazy experiences that you never dreamed about if all you're used to is just kind of conventional mainstream movies. And so the way that um, the way that Deborah Harry delivered that line, it, it hit me in the forehead like a goddamn lightning bolt, and I've probably <laughs> never fully recovered. But also, I just love the underground world explored in this movie. This idea that there's a world, like a media ecosystem, where people run sketchy ch cable TV channels, where they're meeting in hotels in the middle of the night and buying weird pornographic VHS cassettes, or using um, antenna trying to find like random movies like that might be like, kind of floating around the ether out there. If you just point the satellite in the right direction, perhaps you will find a snuff film or a show like Videodrome. And even more alarming, maybe you don't need to travel to Southeast Asia to find where this show is being produced. It might just be getting shot in Pittsburgh. <laughs> There's not the way that James Woods keeps saying, Pittsburgh, it just makes me laugh. I, I don't even know really why. But then obviously the plot continues to evolve from there where he realizes or he comes to understand that the video drum signal is turning them into a weapon. There are different forces at play, and maybe the movie gets too conspiratorial for its own good, but like in a lot of other movies like Scanners or Crimes of the Future, you've got these underground factions kind of waging a war that no one else is aware of, and he's become just yet another tool in this ongoing, uh, ongoing battle. And even if I don't fully understand the end, it is very satisfying when he assassinates that one character. It's like, death the video group. I can't even speak. I've been talking too long. Death to Videodrome, long live the new flesh. And you're like, fuck yeah. Death to Videodrome, long live the new flesh. <laughs> And 
and then after that, once again, like the movie doesn't have uh, much of an ending. Otherwise, I think it would be regarded as perhaps the best science fiction and or best horror film ever made. It's just that fucking good. And the movie is so eerily prophetic about so many things to come. Like I've mentioned before earlier in the video when James Woods is basically like having like foreplay with his TV and rubbing it and veins are pulsing and getting engorged with blood and you can hear Nikki's breath coming out of it and the, uh, the controllers for his uh, whatever uh, system he has are uh, kind of undulating with the waves. People do have a very sexual relationship with their video games and their technology here in the modern age, but this movie was made you know, 40 fucking years ago but I think it all would have fallen to pieces if not for a few contributions. Obviously, you need Rick Baker's incredible special effects. I mean, it's just I mean, Rick Baker delivered solid gold to, uh, to David Cronenberg. But in the absence of Deborah Harry and James Woods and their fearless ability to explore some pretty forbidden terrain, this movie wouldn't even work. Like in that initial interview when they're doing that, um, that stupid reality, not reality show, but that sh stupid talk show together, and she's wearing that red dress and he's turned on by her and he's basically flirting with her and trying to seduce her then and there. You know what Freud would have said about that dress. And he would have been right. I admit it. I live in a highly excited state of overstimulation. Listen, I'd really like to take you off to dinner tonight. You believe that they have the hots for each other. And if they didn't so clearly have the hots for each other, or at least as actors delivering performances, the whole movie would just fall to pieces. Like you can't have the new sex or the new flesh unless you have actors that are just gonna completely embrace the dark side and explore this parallel universe and all of its different possibilities. But before I make too many more embarrassing confessions on my part about my obsession with the Videodrome, maybe I should just move on to yet another movie with a, yet another strange fascination with unconventional sexuality, but Dead Ringers from 1988. And I think my love and affection for this movie boils down to one simple explanation. I had a really good time the first time I watched it. It was my last year in college. A couple of friends of mine and I, we sat down to watch it and we were just screaming and laughing and horrified and absorbed and fat, like every emotion that David Cronenberg wants the audience to feel or experience while watching Dead Ringers, we felt those, those emotions in abundance when we were just like flabbergasted by everything about it from the topic to the screenplay to the performances, I mean, multiple performances by Jeremy Irons I mean, holy shit, you want to talk about a movie that hinges upon the performance of the, of the main actor? Without Jeremy Irons, Dead Ringers would be nothing. But to be fair, if David Cronenberg had cast Jeff Goldblum or Christopher Walken or James Woods in this role, it probably would have worked almost as well. But Jeremy Irons was put on this planet to play these parts. Uh, they, the twin gynecologists, um, Beverly and Elliot Mantle, and I don't even really know how to discuss this because we get into such strange, incestuous, kind of broken territory. Like the fact that one of them is so obsessed with his brother's sexual experiences that he will actually employ twin prostitutes and tell them, I want one of you to call me Beverly and one of you to call me Elliot. It's like, all right, dude, maybe you're a little bit too preoccupied with your brother. As is pointed out by Genevieve Bouchold's character when she's like, what is, what is your deal? Like you can't get it up unless your brother's watching. I mean, that confrontation when she basically realizes or accuses them of having an affair with like both of them at the same time with her while pretending to be one person, brilliant stuff. An absolutely uh, earth shattering scene. This is the most disgusting thing that's ever happened to me. I doubt that. What is it with you, chum? You can't get it up unless little brother's watching. <sighs> this is a bad idea. But the movie also has some like some really powerful um, explorations of like the trials and tribulations and the dangers of drug abuse and which people use drugs where it's not an occupational hazard and which people are basically circling the drain, heading toward their own doom and destruction and how like, you know, like Beverly and Elliot, they're so connected. Like one needs to get on other drugs to help the other get off drugs. I mean, it's just, it's so warped and so dysfunctional. And I just like, every time I watch it, I'm just like glued to the screen. Like I can't believe what I'm fucking seeing. But what's hilarious about the making of this movie is how David Cronenberg says when he was meeting with potential producers and financiers, how they were so undone by and alarmed by the idea that they were playing, that the movie's about twin gynecologists. Like there's even a scene reminiscent of that in the movie where uh, the agent of the actress is like, you know, he's like totally like, you know, like horrified by the discussion she's having with her gynecologist right in front of him. Tell me about my uterus. Well, it has three doorways, three cervixes, leading into three separate compartments in your uterus. That is fabulously rare. And also the idea that she basically has like 
three doorways in her womb, which are making it very difficult for her to uh, to get pregnant, which leads to all these horrible scenes involving like surgical instruments designed to operate on mutant women. I mean, where this movie's willing to go, and how you basically have these like these art exhibits that are being used to uh, to perform like radical surgery, which ends in disastrous ways. I mean, I spend so much of this movie like crossing my legs involuntarily, and I do not have a vagina with which to feel the pain that I'm sure the people are experiencing in the movie, but I feel that pain all the same. In any event, long story short, I rank Dead Ringers as one of the best movies of the 1980s. I put it up there with Milos Forman's Amadeus. I put it up there with David Lynch's Blue Velvet. Like any earth-shattering movie from the 1980s, which seemed to kind of knock the whole film culture sideways, I put Dead Ringers right beside it. I guess that would be an interesting question. Like, what are the great movies from the 1980s that are not pure, like, genre films or franchise films? Because for every movie like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom or Empire Strikes Back, you also have, like, the full-blown, kind of almost, like, decadent, transgressive art house movies like Dead Ringers, which were just absolutely shocking people to the core of their souls. But yeah, I think the film is an undisputed masterpiece. It is my favorite David Cronenberg movie. I mean, there are a lot of movies that could have taken the top spot, but for whatever reason, I just find this movie to be irresistible. I've been watching it on a repeat ever since I first discovered it in 1999, and I don't think that's ever going to change. But on that note, it is time to wrap up this video. My voice has gone hoarse and I'm fucking starving. So it's time to stop this video and start editing. Hope you enjoyed this journey with me. I'll definitely be back with more um, filmography, kind of ranked videos in the future. But right now, I need to eat something before I start gnawing on my arm like a character out of a Cronenberg movie. Thank you so much for sticking with me. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Please remember to subscribe, hit the notification bell, uh, like the video, all the good stuff. But happy Halloween. This is my Halloween present to my, to my subscribers. Hope you enjoyed the ride. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.